guest speaker today is Mr. Alan Cook, from, he's Vice President of Aquaculture for Icicle Seafoods. He's going to talk about the relocation plans for their fish pens to accommodate the proposed Navy Submarine Escort Pier project. Mr. Cook will discuss the impacts of the project and will offer an overview of the preferred new location for the fish pens. The pens are currently located near the pilot station of Edis Hook, you've probably passed them. And the Navy is currently uh, scheduled for completion of their piers uh, during 2016. So please help me welcome Mr. Cook from Icicle Seafoods. Thank you. Hi, how are you guys doing? Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, last time, so today following Santa, last time it was a group of ladies dressed as hobos who did a dance. We were like, selling some kind of um, coupon book. It was awesome. And I, you know, again, a hard act to follow. But, but you know, please put up with me. Um, there you go. Perfect. It was awesome. Rand, Randy and I, our site manager here in Port Angeles, we talk about that all the time. One of the best experiences of the year for me. Um, you, you seem like nice people. You have the misfortune of being my first run through this presentation. So uh, please try to bear with me. So um, talk about the, uh, this is our, this is about our farm in uh, Port Angeles Harbor. The farm's been there for about 30 years. Uh, just a bit about Icicle. This is a fairly wordy slide, you don't have to look at it. Icicle is a, it's a, a large, diversified, US-owned um, seafood company. We have land plants in Alaska, about five of them. Uh, we have, on the left here, we're active in the Pollock and uh, Pacific Cod fisheries in the Bering Sea. So we own a number of uh, catcher vessels and, and floating process vessels. And then uh, the center, and most important to my life, is we own American Gold Seafoods, which is, the operator of all the marine net pen farms in Puget Sound. We have five farms uh, in the Sound. Um, so we we rely on this farm in Port Angeles to round out our business. We have, as I mentioned, we have five farms. We provide fresh farm salmon to the seafood market in the United States 52 weeks a year. Every other year, for about a six-month period, all of the fish is coming out of this farm. It's about a two-year cycle. In our last cycle, which is harvested out in January, February of this year, we harvested just under five million pounds of, uh, of salmon, gutted and, gutted and graded, so round weight much more than that. Um, fish were big. They were about 11.7 pounds, grew really well. We were very, very pleased with the quality of those fish. Um, in that last crop, we had payroll costs here in Port Angeles of $1.1 million, so on a two-year two uh, two cycle, so a pretty decent payroll here. And we spent about $1.5 million in regional supplies and services. So this is just things like equipment rentals, um, marine services, fuel, you know, those sorts of things, dive supplies, etc. Feed, we have a very large feed bill. Our feed comes from Vancouver. It's outside of this number. Um, we're currently undergoing best agriculture practices certification, which is a third-party certification of our farming uh, practices. We've got um, two of our farms certified thus far. Randy is scheduled for his best agriculture practices audit later in December. We, we anticipate he'll pass that, and that's a verification that our farming practices here in Puget Sound are honest, uh, are comparable to everywhere else in the world, and we can really stand behind what we do. We have 10 staff here uh, in Port Angeles. Uh, average uh, employment period is 13.4 is, uh, years. You can see we have sort of there in thirds. We have you know Randy, Brett, and Brad, and Brian have all been sort of 24 years, 27, 28, 29 years. So their, their entire working lives have been spent at this farm. Um, and then we have a, a cohort that's kind of around eight years. And then uh, a new group of guys, uh, Ray, Matt, and Dan, who have only been in for about a year. But these are, these are year-round, 52-week-per-year jobs. The average uh, payroll cost is about $50,000. Now, that includes things like health care benefits, uh, you know, et cetera, insurance plans, that sort of thing. 
so that's it's not really the take-home pay, but it's it's the cost of the company of those of those employees. So pretty decent job. Uh, certainly, I don't know about Ray, Matt, and Dan, but certainly the other guys are all homeowners here in in uh, Port Angeles Squim area uh, and longtime residents of this community. So um, oh, I thought I'd take the transitions out of this. It's not working for me. All right. The, uh, I'm just going to run them in and out off the points. So the, uh, as I think most of you are aware, the Navy is planning to build a pier on it. So the, the port had, uh, had made a proposal to them to continue using the commercial existing space that was here in the, uh, in the harbor, but the, the Navy has said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to move out onto the hook so we can be part of the uh, secure perimeter around the Coast Guard base. When they put out their... Um, their EA, their environmental assessment for the project in January. Um, they identified three options. None of them were particularly great for us, but they all sort of had varying levels of community resistance to them. Uh, over the course of the summer, they came up with a fourth option, and the fourth option is what's shown in the picture here. And I'm sorry, that's a little, uh, this is the only image I have, and this is a, a satellite image of our farm. Uh, we have six cages here and 14 cages here. And then you can, it's hard to see, but they've got the pier coming straight off and actually our lease runs here and we have our moorings run, our moorings run from the cages into this section here. And basically they're gonna push, uh, push into our lease with the pier itself. Uh, so they're expropriating a significant portion of the lease. And then the larger impact on our lease is their uh, security perimeter, their 400 foot security perimeter around the, uh, around the farm which actually extends out over our cages right here. So, um, you know, we, we looked at this and we think that during construction, um, we're likely to have significant impacts in terms of pile driving, in terms of, uh, you know, risk to the facility of construction equipment, debris, uh, 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 you know, the, the upwelling that'll happen as they disturb the benthic sediments. Um, and we'll have, at any given time, we have about a million dollars worth of fish in each cage. So we have a lot of, in, a lot of money invested in the fish that are swimming in those pens. Um, and long term, we have a real concern that the vessels, you've, you've probably all seen the vessels, the two blocking vessels are about 250 feet long. They're 7,000 horsepower in, in engine strength, four bow thrusters. Uh, a very a 5,000 horsepower main. They're a very, very, um, you know, uh, high-powered vessel. And the way they've drawn this uh, this pier, they'll be navigating within 50 feet of our farm. If if my, uh, you know, if my sort of very scientific cutting out the shape of the boat and then sort of maneuvering it around the, uh, the pier uh, works, they'll be certainly within 100 feet, but more likely within 50 feet of our farm. And under heavy thrust, close to the farm, there's a risk that if we have a diver in the water, that that person will be washed backwards in the pen. And then the pens themselves, under that kind of thrust, can collapse and catch fish and pinch. If, they're, uh, if, if it's sucking towards the vessel, they could suck a net into the prop, cut the net, which could result in the, in the release of fish. We also feel that having them operate this close to us in the long term is going to the probability of them running into our pens is fairly low, given that these are high, highly maneuverable vessels. But the ducks start to line up, and eventually it's going to happen that they're going to hit our pens. And like I said, we have people working on those pens 365 days a year. We have divers in the water five days a week. And you know we're just concerned that this is not a good place for us to farm. We've expressed concerns to the Navy about these impacts since 2012. In writing, uh, we spoke first to their consultants who were doing the study. We spoke directly to the Navy. We had a meeting late last week with the uh, senior command from Kitsap Naval Base, and you know we just feel that our presence there is not compatible long term. But the Navy is quite determined to go ahead and build in that location. Uh, so we are uh, making efforts to relocate our farm. I'm going in here. All right. So, sorry, I'm just going to run this in. This is this is the suffering part you people get about being the, um, the first run through. So we we felt you know as we kind of uh, we need this farm. Um, 
our first option was, well, let's do nothing. Let's just continue on and, and farm in that same location. As we mentioned before, we just don't think that's a great long-term option. In the short term, there's construction risks to our livestock in the long term. We're going to end up with a, with a release of fish resulting from either nets being sucked into the boat or the boat hitting us. Um, and, you know, this industry has struggled with the escapes issue. There were escapes, the last significant escapes were in the 90s. We still live that down to this day. I mean, there are no feral populations of Atlantic salmon, there's no exotic diseases, so we feel scientifically there's no major risk um, associated with Atlantics getting into the water. They'll just become food for sea lions and orcas. But politically, it's just, it's not something we want to have happen. And then also, we can think about, we've got 20 pens, about a million dollars per pen, we've got about 20 million dollars in stock, so a release for us uh, a business of our size is fairly devastating. So, you know, we, we spend a million to two million dollars a year maintaining our nets to make sure that we don't have a release and we don't want the Navy being the cause of one either. So, doing nothing was not an option. We looked at land-based farming. Uh, we farm about a third, our fish, about a third of their lives are spent on a, in a land-based recirculation hatchery, which is the type when people talk about, well, move them all on land, and that's what we're talking about. So we understand that technology really well. Um, but in looking at the experience with that kind of uh, technology for doing grow out volumes, they're, they're, they're a recipe for bankruptcy. They just don't work. And then on top of that, the farm that we're proposing is about a $7 million investment. A land-based farm to do the same quantity of fish would be about 200 million. It's 199.4 million is what the number is. And it's not, you just can't get that level of investment. It's just, it's impossible for us to, to generate that and to, to generate a return on that scale of investment. So land base isn't going to work for us. So our option is, is to relocate the farm. It's crit As I mentioned before, it's critical to our ability to serve the market 52 weeks a year. Our families, uh, rely, our, our, our families or our employees here rely on it. We've got a 30 year history of good performance here. Um, and we have, uh, so we've identified a potential new, new site that we'll talk about here. This site will put us at, at a distance away from heavy vessel traffic, all vessel traffic, including the Navy ships. Uh, it'll put us in, a, in an area with very limited conflict with other, uh, other marine users. Um, better currents for better dispersal of fish, fish waste from the farm. Um, and it allows us to modernize our farm and increase our production modestly uh, to account for it and it'll allow us to continue uh, having an impact in this community. Uh, sorry. So, um, as we looked at this, the, the key thing for us is community support, and that's partly why I'm here today, is that you know we need the community to support our desire to relocate, recognizing that fish farming is a potentially contentious issue, but ultimately you've gotta, you've gotta deal with that anyway, so you might as well embrace it and try to make that happen up front. Um, we're really committed to interacting constructively with the, uh, with, the, with the community to understand the concerns and to try to address them, recognizing that not, there, there are, there's a core of people who aren't going to love us regardless, but you know, we just need to appeal to the uh, more reasonable people out there. I'm, I might rephrase that one differently next time. <laughs> but, so, uh, permitting is extremely complex uh, for a salmon farm. There's about 11 different permits, local, state, and federal um, permits. I did it in the opposite direction. Uh, so we have to go through, we have to provide a ton of, it's about, uh, about $80,000 in scientific studies to file the application, and then there's all the follow-up time that, that goes to you know, um, communicating the uh, concerns, that sort of thing. So huge investment. So we've done most of that. Uh, we've done a site evaluation. Uh, we've done a biological evaluation at a site. We've done a benthic assessment, which tells what's the bottom look like and what's your impact going to be on the bottom. We've done wave height and current assessments to make sure that those are all within farming, good farming uh, characteristics. Uh, we're developing engineered plans and drawings to make sure the farm is suited for that location. And we have a project plan of operations that will be submitted as part of our application. And this is all available uh, it's all public record, so it's all stuff that the community can get get a good look at. All right. So the site we've chosen th now this um, <coughs> this map. So Ennis Hook is here. The very tip of Ennis Hook is here. Our current farm is over in this direction, right over here. So we've identified a spot that's 
two miles east of the harbor mouth um, and about a mile and a half or 1.7 miles offshore of Greenpoint. And that's what's shown on this map here. So in looking at this area, one of the key things were, where are we going to impact critical habitats of any kind or critical you know, resource uses of any kind? And the biological evaluation said, no, we're not. So the purple areas in this map indicate areas of, um, what do they phrase it? Um, various priority species. So that would be things like gooey ducks, halibut, um, you know, uh, salmon, salmon fry, that sort of thing. And interesting to us, when we chose this area, we didn't know it was going to map out this way, but the interesting thing to us was that our existing site is in a critical area. Uh, our existing site is <coughs> the red dot, right, or the purple dot right here. Uh, and then this yellow dot represents the site we've chosen. So it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a very different site from our, from our existing farm. Much higher currents, much higher wave action, much more exposed. So. Uh, a, a much different site, and in, in almost every kind of measurable respect, a better site uh, for raising fish. And it has the added benefit of being, of, of contributing to harbor cleanup, getting less nutrient impact in the harbor. So uh, we're pleased that it kind of mapped out that way. And the, one of the key concerns for us, and I'm sorry about the image resolution, we're working on this, is the, the viewscape concerns for people on Green Point, we wanted to make sure that um, there wasn't a significant impact on their quality of life by having a farm immediately off them, but we're so far offshore that the people who live on Greenpoint are really, it's going to be a line, not on the horizon, but not far from the horizon. So it'll be, it's, it's a good long distance away from, from those homes. So we think that uh, although they may object initially, we can provide data to show that they won't hear the farm, and for most respects, they won't see much of the farm either. Uh, so the, the image on the left shows um, where, how it will appear from about 160 feet up on the bluff. We have another image that we're working on from 300 feet. You get more of a view from 300 feet up because you're just your perspective changes. But from the water line, a 50 foot elevation, it's, it's basically a line on the horizon. Much as our existing farm here is kind of a line on the horizon for most people who view it from, uh, you know, the rest areas or from here. You know, you can just, it's, it's a very low visual impact set, uh, operation. So this is the farm we had in wine, and it's, it's 14 uh, cages. They're circular cages, plastic, and the idea behind the plastic cages is they're very flexible, so the wave, as the waves go through, the cages conform to the waves, uh, so it's, it's really suited. These are cages designed for high energy offshore locations. Um, all the brand new built for this. Um, from a surface area point of view, it's got the same surface area as our existing farm, about 0.2 of an acre larger, but very, very similar. Um, and then from a production point of view, it, it does have an increase in production. We go from about 820,000 fish per cycle to 1.1 million. So there's an increase there, but given the characteristics of the site, it'll actually be less impactful than our existing operation. And the farm will have, um, the farm will have a floating feed shed with an automatic feed system, it's pictured here. Um, and that will have, uh, one of the key things for us in this location is, is the guys have to be able to get there and back safely and work in that operation safely. So this, this feed shed will have a operation capability, so it'll be connected, the feed, feeding systems will be connected by computer to our office here in town. And uh, Randy and the guys can pull up the cameras and feed the fish from shore if, uh, if the weather's too, uh, too stinky to get out to the farm. On the same, on the flip side, if the if the weather becomes too stinky out of the farm once they're there, it's an all weather uh, it's an all weather shed, so they'll be able to walk right out any storm uh, there. So it's, it'll be it's custom built. It'll be a, a good operation. So we've looked at the tidal currents, and I won't bore you with the details on here, but the tides range from about one and a half knots down to about a half a knot, depending on where they are. Very manageable. Um, the, uh, the wave heights, so we need to plan for the 100 year maximum wave height estimated from the modeling is about 4.2 meters, so that's is that 13, 14 feet. So that's a big wave, so we'll engineer to make sure that we can do that and more. These cages and these systems are used on the east coast where 10 meter waves are not entirely uncommon, so it's, it's certainly a, a feasible. Uh, we've taken sediment samples, and the expectation when you do um, sediment samples is that when 
the uh, Department of Ecology comes out and does samples, you have to, 100 feet away from the farm, you have to be at a level that, for total organic carbon, uh, copper and zinc, you have to be at a level that was there before the farm. So you can't, more than we'll need to manage that very carefully in terms of feeding uh, to make sure that we're not having, a, having an impact on the benthic layer. Uh, so, uh, next steps, um, we've scheduled a pre-application meeting uh, with the county, we're following up with the city, because I think there's a bit of a question mark as to whether this is urban growth area or whether it's county. Either way, we'll work with either or both to make sure that we're uh, good. Um, we'll finalize our application uh, and, and finalize the reports. Again, they're all public records, so they're all available if, uh, if you have enough curiosity to dig them out. Uh, we'll submit the JARPA. The JARPA is a, it's a joint aquatic resource permit application and it goes to all the various and sundry agencies that are involved in reviewing this. And then follow through. So, you know, our, what we're trying to do is communicate with the community and address concerns as they come up. So, you know, I can leave my contact information. If you have concerns, I'd be pleased to hear about them. But a lot of this has to flow through various levels of government. And, you know, to do that, I think the people in government need to be comfortable that we're capable of operating this farm safely and that they're able to make uh, a decision based on good science and not have it become career poison for uh, a commissioner or somebody in government. So we certainly are prepared to do our part. Uh, we've invested a lot of money up front to try and prepare the materials and the data to make sure that a, Good science can drive the decision on this, but you know that's that that's something we gotta stay in touch with and follow through. I think that's it. Yeah, you guys, that's people have suffered enough. Thank you. Yeah, any questions, sir? With regards to obviously you you covered a number of things that city and the county will do. Now this state throws a lot branches in every single time anybody wants to do something and obviously your business to this community is worth quite a bit. How, all the state agencies that will be involved in this, and it won't be just one of them, have you approached all them yet and where does that stand? We have, um, we have let most of them know that an application is forthcoming, but uh, one of our next steps is to uh, meet with each agency and share the, the JARPA, the application form, and the, and the materials that support it with them, and try and get, get some sense of uh, what they think. Department of Ecology and DNR are the two really key ones, and, and they both know this is coming. So uh, hope, we're hopeful that they'll be supported. Greenpoint in the water, but what would the landmark be, for instance, if, you know, and Greenpoint's a big fishing area, for the sports fishermen, I know that. But if you look toward land, what would be a landmark? An old dungeon S schoolhouse that, you know, oh, I'm sorry, something I don't know. on land that we could say it's right off there. Or or like well, it would be east of Morse Creek. East and, and about a mile, <coughs> and be like 1.8 miles. So like off Chinaman's Cave? I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know the area well enough to tell you. Yes, yeah, probably right about. Right about there. Yeah, and it's in terms of sport fishing and doing gooey duck harvesting. That's one of the reasons the farm is sited so far offshore is to be clear of most of that. Is there a concern with all the cruise ships that come in and pass there and well, pick up I mean, their pilots? Um, we've spoken to some of the marine traffic people and, and the. the the word we got was that we're quite clear of their normal traffic patterns. We'll obviously have radar deflectors on the farm and, and corner lights to mark it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's always a concern uh, when you put something new in the water. But, you know, we, we should have enough of a radar signature to be observable. Sir? I was trying to tell exactly where your dot was. Is it is it within the channel itself, or is it outside of the red and green booms? It's outside of the red and green booms. Right. Yeah. So does the Coast Guard have to get involved with? Oh yeah. Okay. Everybody. So have Maybe. you talked with them yet? Uh, we, have, we have talked to the Coast Guard, yes. 
kind of about this. And they're aware of the, um, locally, they're aware of the location and don't have an issue with it. We still have to go through the hazards navigation, I think they call it, permit. And that will be handled, I believe, through the Seattle uh, office. And we have not talked to them about it yet. Um, Army Corps will also get involved in, in that. And they're aware that this is coming. Um, but it's, it's an agency we have to spend a lot of time to manage our relationship with and make sure they get what they need. Assuming everything is all put together, permitted, ready to go, how do you transfer everything from the current site to the new location? Well, ideally, we do. We uh, stock a new group of fish in the new cages. So our it might be a pipe dream, but our next crop will harvest out by December of 2016. And so we typically let the farm sit empty for two months to let the benthic layer recover and break any disease cycles, etc. Before we stock the new, ideally we would have the new farm in place and would be stocking it for kind of March 2017. If that doesn't happen, we'll stock in the old farm and then we'll just move them by boat. You can just suck them on board with using a vacuum pump into the boat, take them over, let them know. <laughs> <laughs> The existing pens, it appeared that it was the section, the easternmost pen, that had the, the most conflict with the Navy ships, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Could you just move that east section to the west of the other one and just more or less expand your lease to the west? Well, to the west would be right in front of the, uh, um, the pilot house. And also the public boat launch. Okay. So and and that would get over there. There's a reef that's just to the west of the farm would get over. So that's not going to be palatable for a number of reasons. And you can't go further south and just extend the 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 footprint for south. You know the problem is when you do if you if you modify the boundaries of a DNR lease by more than I think it's four percent, you have to go through the whole application process anyways. And so our thinking is. Look, if, if we're going to go through the whole process, let's just try and get a better farm. It's really, uh, you know, administratively, um, it's no uh, it's no worse than trying to apply for a new farm. Yes, um, the community certainly values the the long-term long family wage jobs you provide our, our community, and we. <coughs> No, not so far. I mean, that's a, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a, so far they're trying to maintain uh, the fiction that um, they're not in conflict with our operation, which is, you know, just kind of an emperor's new clothes sort of situation where they're insisting that it's not a conflict because if they, if they agree that it's a conflict, then they're on the hook for some level of compensation. So, but that, you know, that's an argument that we, uh, we'll have, or, or a discussion we'll have with it. It may not, it may not need to be an argument. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Jeff, what with regards to marine services, at the moment you've been very fortunate that our launch does quite a bit of work for you in the harbour here. Yeah. Will this affect the running out there? Because, I mean, that's quite a distance that you've got to go from where all the piers are here, where all the boats are. Long. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the, uh, so Jack, yeah, does all of our freighting, moves all of our feet, um, and so we used about 3,000 tons of feed on the last crop. So there's a fair, a fair amount of uh, feed that goes out with his lunch. And um, so, yes, it'll, the, the run times are further, so there'll be somewhat more cost related to moving feed out. If we get this farm approved, we'll be using more feed because we'll have more fish. Um, and then the other thing that's part of this project that I haven't talked about here is uh, the Navy was, you know, they kind of doubled down on their impacts on us because they selected the, the, the land that we rent in Edis Hook as the target for their mitigation. Um, you know, and so we're getting effectively, you know, kicked out of at least the DNR portion of that. I think the city's been a little more accommodating on that. But uh, so we're going to move. Um, into town um, 
into some existing commercial space in town here. So it'll mean, in the end, it'll mean more, more work for Jack with, with that. But that's kind of factored into our planning, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're looking for more fish so we have more revenue out of that operation to kind of support some of the additional costs we'll, we'll see from that. I mean, another win for the community with this project is that that area of Ennis Hook is a bit of an eyesore, and all of that fill, all of those creosote pilings, the derelict building, are likely to be removed. You know, assuming the city um, and DNR and the Navy can come to an agreement on how that, how that happens, it'll re restore a lot more of that area to a natural, more park-like environment, which will be a nice win, both for the marine environment, also for the, for the viewscape of, the, of Edis Hook. So the ask that you're asking for the community is to support your move and support the Navy's building where they're suggesting be built out? Well, at this point, I don't know. The Navy's going to do, my sense is the Navy's going to do what the Navy does, regardless of what this community really feels about it. I think that, you know, them putting that facility here, um, if it leads to remediation of a big chunk of the hook, if it leads to us in a, in a location where we can preserve jobs and economic activity, I think it can be a win, a win for the community. But I think it, at this point, the opportunity for the, the, the community to have much of an impact on that plan is, from my you know, very narrow perspective, pretty limited. I think the Navy has made up their mind that they're going to build there, and that's where they're, they're going. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.